So we're going to get into um, our message today. Uh, this week I've been struggling with vertigo, and so if my message is a little bit wonky, that's why. <laughs> there you go, it's hard, writing on an angle. Um, anyway, but I feel, I feel pretty good today. I was actually quite sick last night. I woke up in the middle of the night uh, very ill, and I was wondering, I didn't think I could preach in the morning, and uh, so I'm wondering who am I going to get, Raglan's gone, and I get a text message at 5 a.m., from Charles saying, if you need me to preach today, I'll preach. And I thought, oh man, what a guy. Good for him. Good for him. So, but I am here, so that's good. And uh, we'll get, make our way through our text today. And I'm excited to hear and look at what God's got for us as we open his word together. And so the title of the message this morning is The Power of the Gospel. The power of the gospel. And the big idea is this, that the cross has restored our relationship with the Father allowing us to trust and love him regardless of our circumstances. That the cross has restored our relationship with the Father, allowing us to trust and love him regardless of our circumstances. A few years ago, it was uh, in February of 2020, just before COVID came to Canada, uh, my oldest son, Austin, was in South Africa visiting. And before he was scheduled to come home, a situation sort of arose uh, where he had to come home quite suddenly, uh, which sent his mom and I scrambling to try and get him home and get flights together. South Africa is not a close place, you know, it's a very far away place. And so the suddenness and trying to get the flights to work and everything kind of had to work together perfectly if we were going to get him from South Africa to Canada as quickly as we could. Well, the first flight was leaving from Durban for him and uh, going to Johannesburg. And if he could make that flight, then he could line up with his next flight from uh, Johannesburg to Frankfurt. Well, as he got on, got there, uh, the flight from Durban to Johannesburg was an hour, delayed by an hour, so he missed that flight. But then he was able to get on another flight, and they put him on a different flight from Johannesburg to London. And so he was able to get on that flight from 11 hours from South Africa to London. He was the last plane to land in London before everything was shut down due to a horrific storm. Uh, he had an eight-hour layover in the London air airport, supposed to go on a different plane, but then they put him on some other plane. Finally, they get him onto this flight to Toronto. Uh, but because of the storm, something had happened with some of the doors, either on the plane, I don't know, but they made the announcement that your luggage, the luggage would not be traveling with them. Um, so it was another two hours on the tarmac as they waited to take off because of the storm from Tor to Toronto. Uh, in Toronto, he had a five-hour layover uh, because of a snowstorm that was there. And then he boarded the plane and waited another three hours on the tarmac. He finally took off, and after a very chaotic 52 hours of travel and no sleep, he landed in Vancouver. What a long journey, and what an ordeal. However, all the way from South Africa, right from the very beginning, there was a lady who was about Christina and I's age, who was on every flight with him, as chaotic as that was. I mean, they were switching in the middle of, you know, at the airport, switching here and there, but she was on her way back to the same place and on every flight with him, and she actually lived in North Vancouver as well. And as they flew, they helped each other. He lifted her bags, and, uh, and they kind of worked together as they traveled along this sometimes confusing journey home. Now, from a fair parent's perspective, tracking these flights, hoping that he made these flights, waiting, we were so glad that this sort of mom was there with him every step of the way. We liked the fact that he wasn't alone. We didn't know this lady at all, but we were so thankful for her because she was there with someone that we really did care about. As we come to this, into this next passage of Scripture, we first encounter Paul. Last week we went from uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. Today we're picking up from Romans 1, starting in verse 8 and working our way to verse uh, 17. And as we come to this passage of Scripture, verses 8 to 17, we first encounter Paul writing and saying that he was so thankful for the Roman church. He had not met the Roman church. They had not affected him directly in any way. Yet he was incredibly thankful for them. Why was Paul so thankful for this church? Well, I think it's directly related to the gospel that he had encountered years before on the road to Damascus. 
And so let's pray, and then we're going to jump into this passage of Scripture where we discover Paul, an incredibly thankful man for this church in Rome. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you today, Lord, we just thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the truth that it will speak to us. And Lord, as we, as we open it, as we listen, as we engage, we welcome your Holy Spirit this morning to come and to teach us and to lead us and to direct us. Father, help us to hear what you're saying. Help us to see what you're saying. Help us to be touched by what you're saying this morning. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. And we thank you that as we open your word, you do speak. And we welcome you to come and to change our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Paul finishes with his intro and his greeting in verses 1 to 7 as we walked through last week putting everyone on many ways on the same page with who Jesus is, that Jesus is the Messiah and he is our Savior and King. He then goes into how he is thankful for this church in Rome. And so we begin in verse 8, and it starts like this. It says, first, I, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. As we come to the first part of this section, Paul says, I thank my God for all of you. Monday, as I was considering this passage, I, I just began to think, I thought, why, Paul, are you thankful for them? You have no idea who they are. As far as I know, they've done nothing for you. If I was to ask you to, to tell me, really, if this morning as you're here, if I was to ask you to tell me three things that you were thankful for right now, what would you say? Well, if you were like me, you would think of, uh, think of things that affected you directly. Uh, I have a, a long, well, I have a couple of journals at home, and part of the questions in the journals are, uh, each day they're like, uh, name some things that you're thankful for. And as I look back at all of those things that I had said that I was thankful for, they were things that di directly affected me. I mean, I might say, if I was writing to the church in Rome, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting you, I'm excited to see you, I'm excited to get to know you, but why would I be thankful? The next part tells us. He says he's thankful for them because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. He's thankful because of their faith. This is nothing really to do with him, but has everything to do with the God that he serves. Or his master, as we learned from last week. Paul is not so much concerned about himself as we, you know, as we followed him through the book of Acts. He, he made that quite evident. No, he is most concerned about the work of his master. He is the most concerned with God's glory. And when that happens, he is thankful, whoever it is, wherever it is. Much like I was thankful for that lady who was with Austin on that journey, who I did not know and did not affect me directly, but she affected somebody that I love very much. And so as I thought about what, Paul, what made Paul so thankful, I began to think, is this the same for me? When I am most thankful to God in, in, in what he does for me, when I look, I'm always thankful for God. I'm like, oh God, thank you, you did this for me. Thank you, you saved me. Thank you, you helped me. Now, of course, we should be thankful for that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be. But I had to ask myself, am I more concerned about my master's business than my own? That was a very challenging thought for me this week. Paul is not thankful that they continued in his teaching. He never planted the church. He's never met them. He's just so thankful for their lives, bringing glory to the Master. If you have a gratitude journal, I would ask, when was the last time that you wrote in there that, that you were grateful God was getting the glory for something unrelated to you? That really challenged me this week. In verse 9, as we continue along, as he shares about his thankfulness for this church, he goes in and he says, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Paul has wanted to see them for a very long time. He has a desire to see them, but God has not allowed him to. Again, in Paul's life, the will of the Master or, or the will of the Father outweighs his own will. This is very much the actions of a servant, or as we talked about, a slave, as Paul describes himself right at the very beginning of Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul's first concern is the will of the Master. Jesus is everything. 
to Paul. So you come to verse 11, it says, for I, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. He wants to come to them. He wants to, to strengthen them, to encourage them, to impart something to them. However, not only to give, but there is this mutuality to this visit. Verse 12, he says, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And so he also sees this as though they too have something to give him. And I think this is so good sometimes, especially, you know, if you're older in the faith, you can think that it's just about us or you imparting things to those younger. And that, and that is true. But if that's all we see, then we, we leave a lot of things on the table. There's a humility that says you, you also can speak into my life. In many ways, it's sort of an, an attitude to which we come into to meeting with one another. And I think this is the, one of the beautiful things of belonging to a local church. This mutuality towards each other and encouraging one another even as we come on a, on a Sunday morning. Verse 13, it says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I'm under obligation, he says, to both Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I want to come to you, he says. That, that's my desire. That's my heart. I haven't been able to because God's been directing me other places. But I want to come to you and I want to be encouraged by you and to encourage you. But there's more. Remember that Rome is a, is a giant city at the time. It is the center of the world in many ways. Its population, if you, if you kind of extrapolate that and look at Rome back in the ancient city and, and how many people were there, and if you put it in today's sort of term to kind of get an idea of how big this city was in the ancient world, it would probably be about 133 million people. So that's kind of the size relative to what's going on in that time. It's a very major center uh, in, the, in the world at that moment. And he wants to come and he wants to share the gospel. But he uses a word here that seems kind of a little bit odd, at least for me it did. The word is obligation. We understand sharing the gospel out of love for people. We talk about that often, but out of obligation. It seemed kind of strange. It seems strange, but on a closer look, the word is the, like the word debt. I am in debt to them. What does this mean? Well, there's a couple of ways of being in debt. I don't know if you know that. Uh, one is bad enough, but this one. Um, if you come to me and you say, look, Marcel, you say, I'm really short this month. And can you lend me a hundred dollars? And so I go to the bank and I take out a hundred dollars and I give it to you. Now you would be in debt to me. You owe me that hundred dollars. This is not the debt or obligation that Paul is speaking about. And there's another type of debt, so to speak. So let's say my boys, when they were, they were small again, Jordan, my youngest, he comes to me and he says, you know, let's say that Austin and Jordan, they're playing together. And Jordan comes to me and says, Dad, you know what? I'm, I'm really hungry. I say, okay, here are two apples, one for you and one for your brother. Take that and then, uh, then give that one to your brother. Now, as Jordan has two apples, Jordan has the obligation to give the uh, other apple to his brother. And in a way, he is in debt to his brother until he gives that apple to his brother. He's holding something that he is, has to give because I have given it to him to do that. And this is what Paul is saying. His desire to share the gospel here does not come from a deep personal love for the people of Rome. It comes from his love of God. Hudson Taylor, one of the great missionaries of our time, went to China to share the gospel. And if you want to be really challenged, I would say read his autobiography. It's a very challenging book. But he was in a conversation with the man, and in the conversation... The man said, you know, you must really love the Chinese people. You gave up everything to come here so that they could hear the gospel. Man, you must really love them. To which Hudson Taylor replied, he said, no. <laughs> kind of shocking. No, no. It's not because I love the Chinese. He said, it's because I love God. My son might be mad at his brother. Jordan might be mad at Austin. But if he has any love for me, any respect for me, he'll gladly 
give him the apple. Not because he cares about his brother so much, but because he loves me. To share the gospel effectively, you don't necessarily have to have a deep love for people, but you absolutely need to have a deep love for God. So along with being mutually encouraged, he wants to share the gospel because he loves God. And so he says in verse 15, so, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who, are, uh, also who are in Rome. I don't know you. I don't have a particular passion necessarily for Romans. But man, do I love the Lord. And so I can't wait to do what he calls me to do. To share his love. And for me, this week, again, it was just another moment of pr a profound thought that just sort of ricocheted around in my mind. He continues along in verse 16. He says, for I am not ashamed. This is sort of the highlight. Verses 16 and 17 are sort of the, the central passage or central verses of this section. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure about you, but often I have thought about this particular passage of verse. And I've been perplexed at it in certain times. I, I wondered, why, why would he say this, I am not ashamed? Many commentators say that in a roundabout way, he's declaring that he is proud of the gospel. And yet others say there is a sense that he wrestles with the idea of the gospel. That when he stands up and declares this, that he knows. He knows what people think. And I mean, in that day and age, the idea of a God dying on a cross, the idea of a God dying on a cross, well, well, that's a symbol actually not of strength. That's a symbol of weakness. That's not a God you would want to serve. No, you want to serve a God that would smite his enemies with power and strength, not humility and weakness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23, Paul says to the church in Corinth, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. One group will be offended, the other group thinks it's foolish. And I think that many of us at times can identify with this. Your neighbor maybe starts to open up, and starts to share with you, and you know they need Jesus, you know it. But as you think about it in that moment, maybe you think, is this really my answer? Put everything all of your hope and all of your life into the hands of a God that you cannot see. Who I have to declare died on a cross and then rose from the dead. And you believe it, but, but many of us as we speak it uh, of, to others who do not, we might think to them it's going to sound like some sort of fairy tale or some sort of myth or some sort of legend. There can be a sense of maybe holding back. And I think I, I told you this. I, I know I told my small group this. It happened just um, last spring. Uh, but I was driving up Mountain Highway. It was a Saturday morning. And I was going to small group. And I was just sort of working through the sermon uh, for Sunday in my head. And this voice came into my ear. And it said, are, are you sure? Are you sure? And the thought was based around the fact that, that as people listen to me speak or hear me say something, they may actually act on the things that are said. And Marcel, if you're telling them to put their whole hope in Jesus for their marriage, for their family, for their career, their future, man, you better be sure. Because that's kind of out there. Put all your hope into this cosmic being that you can't see. And I don't know if Paul ever struggled intellectually or as a former Jew, but even though it's foolishness to the Gentiles, even though that person may think it is crazy, Paul says, look, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. As much as everyone in this, this culture may think that it's kind of crazy, and there may be a temptation to hold back. I don't want people to think I am crazy too, but, but Paul says, look, we can't be ashamed of the gospel. Because even if they think we are crazy, that is the answer. And that's the only answer. There is no other way. And so I'll risk sounding a little bit crazy to you. It's the power of God for salvation. There's no other way. Wouldn't it be easier if you could just 
tell your neighbor or coworker or friend, hey, just do the best you can. You'll get there. Even if it might be easier, with very little risk, it's the wrong answer. The power of salvation comes only through the gospel of Jesus, regardless of what anyone may think. As we come to verse 17, he says, for, it, it, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. That is, that, that in it, we see God making people right with himself. We remember from a number of weeks ago when we talked about the word righteous and how that word actually in a Jewish understanding is a relational word. Our right standing with God. And that our actions can't make a right relationship with God. But we do see what Jesus did on the cross was able to bring about this right relationship. That the good news of Jesus, the gospel, is the power of God to put people in a right relationship with the Father. And nothing else can do that. We see God restoring the relationship with God and man. We see Him being faithful, really, to His promise. So His righteousness through the gospel it is revealed. It goes on and it says this sort of interesting little thing here. It says, from faith for faith. Again, this is a bit complicated to understand. Some say from faith is speaking of, about God's faithfulness to keeping His covenant. For us to put our faith in. This seems to make the most sense to me, especially since right after this, uh, Paul, he quotes Habakkuk. He says this, and right after that, uh, uh, from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This Old Testament quote from Habakkuk was written as Judah was being, the nation, the southern kingdom of Judah was being taken um, into captivity by the Babylonians. You know, you can imagine being one of those Jewish people in that moment, being, t you're walking into slavery, there's not a lot of hope. Babylon has just conquered you and you're off you go. All has been lost. But God says to Israel, the righteous shall live by faith. Or those who are in a right relationship with me live by faith. What do they have faith in? Well, in this moment, what do they put their hope in? Their world is collapsing. They will put it in the faithfulness of God. That even though it looks like all is lost, even though the circumstances around them speak a particular message, everything is done. It's all lost. They put their hope, their faith, their trust in God because God is faithful to bring about His promise, even in the mess that I find myself in. From His faithfulness of God to His promise of restoration, to us putting our faith in, in what He has done and what He will do. And this is how those who are in a right relationship with God, this is how they live. Whatever it looks like right now. And even as you're sitting here today, maybe you're walking through a very difficult moment. The righteous live by faith. Those who are in a right relationship with God, the way we exist in this world is by faith. That, our, that, that we put our hope and our trust in a God who has shown himself faithful. As we've walked our way, we went, as we've talked about, we, we walked our way for three years through the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And what, one of the things that can continue to come out as we were able to kind of look at it from a, you know, a 10,000 foot view is we got to see the faithfulness of God. And irrelevant of the situation, irrelevant of what was going on around them, God was faithful. And you could watch his hand working the story out for his glory and for his purpose. So let's take a few minutes, just a couple of minutes here as we uh, look at this passage to apply a couple, pull a couple things out and to apply them to our lives. The first thing that I kind of uh, jumped out to me that really challenged me this week as I read this passage of Scripture was really the fruit of loving God. The fruit of loving God. As we began at the start of our text, we see Paul being thankful for a group of people who he didn't know and as far as I know had done nothing for him. In your devotional this week, it actually it starts by asking you to write down five things you are thankful for. 
And so I did that faithfully. I'm, I'm working a, a week ahead, so I'm, you know, because uh, i got to preach on it, so I want to just take those devotionals and work the week ahead. And so as on Monday, as I, as I wrote them down on Monday, and then I reflected on them on, on Wednesday, there was one thing that stuck out to me. The thing was that I was thankful for how things affected me. <laughs> I was the central theme of being thankful in this moment. I was thankful for how things affected me. Why did Paul, as we mentioned and talked about, why did Paul give thanks for these believers? I think he did because he loved God more than he loved himself. And these believers were bringing glory to God in Rome. They are being used of God. He spoke, I heard of your faith. God's receiving glory in Rome because of the things you're doing. Man, I am so thankful that you exist and that the light is there. He had heard of their faith where he was, their reputation had traveled. And so if they were putting their hope and trust in God, he was thankful. God was receiving glory. This was a way, uh, this, this way of living also allowed him to not just th- be thanks for people he had never met, but it enabled him actually to give thanks in all situations. Because his thankfulness was not determined by how things affected him, but by how God would be glorified. And if that meant his own demise, well, you know, as we watched him walk through the book of Acts and all of these places, he he seemed to be okay with that. The fruit of loving God more than we love ourselves is a thankfulness for things that are outside of us, that that do not even affect us. We, We become genuinely thankful for things, really, at the end of the day, that bring God glory. And this spills into our own lives. We, we can even then be thankful for ourselves as, as God, be, you know, as we sung that last song, that us, we might decrease, that God might increase. And as, we, as that begins to happen in our lives, we can even be thankful. We can even find ourselves thankful in, in difficult moments. We go through, if, if, if God's getting glory out of this moment, that's what I, I most want. Our thankfulness transcends us because our heart belongs to Him. Secondly, we see Paul saying he was obligated to share the gospel, not out of his love for the Romans, but out of his love for God. And for that reason, he said he was eager to share the gospel. He could hardly wait to share the gospel. And I think the more we're in love with Jesus, the more we're interested in sharing that with others. These two things of biblical thankfulness And sharing of the gospel come from a love of God that is greater than the love we have for ourselves. So how do we do that? Well, first, I want to say I don't think that real true love of the Lord or or any real love is is like a switch on or off. I know when you're in junior high, you see that girl or that boy, it seems like a switch. (laughs) But that's not love. That's just dopamine, right? So real love... It's not a switch that's off and on. I think that it grows. I think it's something that is growing. Uh, From the years 1999 to 2001, Christina and I only had one child. It was just the three of us. And oh man, did I love that little Austin. I loved coming home to him. I loved his energy and attitude. I loved how excited he got when I came home. I was so in love with my little boy. But as the day grew closer for our next child to be born, I started to get a little worried. Because in my brain, I was thinking I would have to now divide my time. I would have to take from my relationship with Austin and give to the other child. And whether I realized it or not, I was thinking that I would have to like, divide my love now between the two of them. And there was no way that I could take any love away from Austin. This was a genuine concern for me. And then Jordan came on the scene. And guess what? I began to fall in love with him too. And what I realized was that I, I did not have to take any love from Austin because what I discovered was that my love grew. I think love is intended to grow. And this includes our love for God. It's intended to grow. And so I would ask you this morning where you're at right now, would you say your love for God is growing or is it moving backwards? Would you say that you are more in love with God today than you were last month? Now I won't ask for a show of hands because we'd all say we all know what the right answer is, but in your heart, honestly, in a moment, 
Just ask that question. Is my love in this moment growing for the Lord? And if not, what's stopping it? It very well could be the love we have for ourselves is so great. I think one of the ways we, uh, actually I thought of that quote, you know, I don't if you remember Owen used to say it often. He said that I fell in love with myself at an early age and I've managed to keep the relationship going ever since. <laughs> and I, I, but I think one of the ways that we grow <clears throat> in our love for God really is through encountering Him, experiencing Him. In our trials, in community. You know, there's something that happens when we are in community uh, together, to grow together. I remember C.S. Lewis, he was sharing about a moment and discovery that he had. Him and a few guys got together uh, often to talk about their, their literary works. And, um, and it, so they got together like all the time and, and they got in this particular space all the time. And, and as they grew older, one of them, they passed away. And, it, and so what was left was C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien were together. And um, so they, what he thought, what C.S. Lewis said that he thought, he said, you know, oh, not, oh, good, that other guy is gone. But he thought, this is going to be really great because now it's just going to be the two of us. It's just going to be me and J.R. Tolkien, and, and, and I'm going to get way more of him. But what he soon realized was that that third person brought out something in J.R. Tolkien that he could not. And so while he got more time with J.R. Tolkien, he ended up getting less of him. And I've noticed that in my small group that as we meet together on Saturday mornings, we've been off for the summer, but as we were meeting together, that each man brings something. And I understand and grow in my love for God when we are together in a way that I cannot do on my own. Making our quiet times non-negotiable. I remember my mom, she would spend an hour of prayer every day. Didn't matter what was going on, she would go in and pray. If I called with exciting news, but it was her prayer time, she wouldn't answer the phone. It was very intentional. And I think there is a sense where we need to be intentional with our time in the sense of growing. Like a marriage, you know, if you want to grow in your love and relationship, you need to be intentional. You can just let things happen and still be married, but there is something about intentionality and growth that work together. And I'd start even today, you know, if you're noticing with your relationship, if you're not growing in your relationship with God, I would really encourage you, spend a minute, just even as we worship at the end here in a few, in a few minutes, uh, praying and saying, God, you know, I, I want to love you more, but I, I notice this trend happening. I'm actually not growing. I'm actually, like, moving in a different direction. And I'd really encourage you just to say, but this is what I want. This is my heart, Lord. Would you show me? And I believe that he will guide you. I believe that he'll show you what that is. The growth of our love for God will be made manifest in all areas of our lives. As you grow in your love for God, that will spill out into so many different areas of your lives as we see it coming out in Paul, in his desire to share Jesus, in his thankfulness for people that he didn't even know. As Jesus begins to take a greater place in our life, our life begins to change. Secondly, the gospel is the power unto salvation. As we work our way through that passage, we, we come to verse 16 and it says, verse 16 and 70, the gospel is the power unto salvation. So Paul, out of his love for God, desires to eagerly share the gospel. As we stated earlier, we know that, that many of his day rejected the gospel. The Gentiles, they, they thought that, um, you know, that it was foolish. They found drawn, they actually found drawn graffiti in Rome dated just after the life of Paul where a person was hung on a cross with a donkey's head and some person worshipping it with the inscription saying, Aleximus worships his God. And it's implied mockery. Many of that day were hostile to Jesus. It seemed absurd for a God to be killed by men with no fight and then to worship a God who seems to lose. And Paul understands that the gospel offends the Jew. It's foolishness to the Gentile. But listen, whether it seems foolish or offensive, whether we feel foolish sharing it or not, it is the power of God for salvation. Where the righteousness of God is revealed. 
There's no other answer for humanity. Some will reject it, some will respond to it, but it is the, still the power of God for salvation. That Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sin. That we might be able to come into a relationship with the Father. There's no other way to accomplish that on our own. I don't know if you've ever been in that position where you've hurt someone so bad that nothing you can do or say will mend that relationship. And really, that's us with God. When we are gods of our own life, we say to Him, I am God, not you. I am in charge, not you. We take His rightful place as King. But when we want to go around and we want to say, ah, God, but, but you're not going to hold that against me, right? Come on, I was a good person. You say, what? You just told God by how you lived that you didn't need Him or want Him and that you would be the one who was King, not Him. That is the word. It's called a coup. It's, a, it's treasonous. How do we come back from treason? We can't on our own. But Jesus makes a way. His righteous act on the cross to restore our relationship, even though you and me committed treason, if we desire to come back into relationship with the Father, we can if we apply what happened on the cross to our lives. And it may seem silly to some, but that is the only way back to the Father. And if you're here today and you have, you have been counting on your good works to get you to heaven, it's not going to go well for you. But Jesus has made a way. He's made a way for you. He made a way for me. And if you'll receive it for yourself, it is the power of God for salvation. The righteousness of God being revealed. And finally, this morning, in the last minute or so we have together, this morning, the text tells us that we live by faith. That the righteous, those who are restored in a right relationship with Jesus, live by faith. You believe and you put your hope and trust in Jesus that He did what He said He would do and will do. What He says He will do regardless of what it looks like. As Judah was being marched away, as we spoke about, as they're being marched away to, to Babylon, and Habakkuk says the righteous will live by faith. Those who trust in God, their lives will be marked by a trust in God that He will not forget them. That He will restore them like He said He will. And even you might be here today and you're, you're right with God, but it would seem that you're walking through a very difficult time. Life is full of difficult moments, moments of trial and struggle, as in many ways we kind of live in a modern day Babylon, awaiting our time with the Savior. But as we live, as, we, as, as ones who are right with God, we live, we trust, we wait by faith. That's how we live. We're in a right relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. The church in Rome, it's going to face a lot of persecution over the next number of years after Paul leaves. Probably for the next 300 years or so. And they would have to live in those moments, hidden away at times, before judges being persecuted. They're going to have to live by faith. And everything around them is going to tell them something different. But they're trusting and saying, no, God is still king. God, you have got this. And while we do not face, I think, in that moment, that, right in Canada anyway, that type of persecution, we still live with pain. We still live in a world where hurt people hurt people. We live in a world where it seems like life is not fair, where, where sickness and death are always kind of lurking. We face betrayal. And so the righteous, we live by faith, putting our trust in a God who loves us, died for us, and will one day return for his bride and set things right. Paul lays down a lot, of these, a lot in these few verses. There's many more things that we could have jumped into. But if you're not growing in your love for Jesus, where He is increasing and you are decreasing, I would encourage you to begin to be intentional in your relationship with Him. Don't, don't settle for a downward slide to Him. If you have never responded to the good news of Jesus, that, that you can be in relationship with the Father through Jesus, today is a wonderful day to do that. 
the gospel, what Jesus has done, is the power unto salvation. There is no other way and no other answer. And if you're in a relationship with Jesus, but things aren't going so well for you today, and you're feeling the effects of this old sinful world, remember today that our lives are lived by faith. Not some sort of like hope and wish and dream kind of idea, but because as we watch him through Scripture, as we've seen him and hear from others, even older saints that have walked the road for a long time, it's because God is faithful. He can be trusted. And so we put our hope and our trust in a God who is faithful. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you today, Lord, we just tell you that, that we love you today. We thank you because you are a faithful God. Right from the very beginning, you have been speaking. Even as we, we read from uh, the, the first five books of the Bible, as Moses wrote those books, and you're, you're speaking about things that you're going to be doing. And Lord, you were faithful to do those things. We read about them <clears throat> over the last number of years together. Lord, as we heard about the prophets speak about what you would do and how you would come, you did come, and you did do those things. Father, you, you are the faithful God. And so, Lord, I would pray for people even here today that are wrestling with something today, that, that there are circumstances in their life or, or fe are, are, are experiencing uh, the pain of this world. Lord, I pray that, that those who are in right relationship with you today would live by faith, putting their hope and trust in a faithful God. And those who don't know you today, Lord, I pray that you would just reveal yourself in a powerful way. Lord, I pray that you would be the one to open eyes and open ears. That, Lord, you are the only way to salvation. You are the only way to a restored relationship with the Father. And, Lord, I would pray, too, for all of us who, who know you that our relationship with you would, would not be in a downward, backward slide, but that, Lord, we would be in a growing relationship where you are increasing and we are decreasing. And the love that we have for you is being spilled out into the world. And so, Lord, we thank you and we love you. We thank you even for your presence among us today as we open your word. We just commit our, ourselves to you now for your glory this week, for your purposes in our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray.